Hi, I'm Colin, and we're back today for our third part of the seminar series. We're going to be doing two seminars today. Uh, the first is how to install concrete interlocking paving stones, and the second will be how to build a basic flower bed. Um, before I get really into the instructions on the how to install paving stones, I always like to talk about the benefits of concrete paving stones versus wet poured concrete or asphalt. Um, so right off the bat, our paving stones are manufactured with the common specification of about 8,000 PSI or above. Uh, wet poured concrete is typically 4,000 PSI. Um, so to start, our paving stones uh, have over twice the density, therefore they will last a lot longer than wet poured concrete and they will not deteriorate as fast. Um, also, the main function of a paving stone system is to be flexible. Uh, so there's excavation and a gravel base involved and compaction and a bedding layer. Uh, so all that system combined makes for a very good pavement system that is long lasting. Um, so those are basically the two main points. You have a, a long lasting system that is developed and you have a surface or a pavement piece that is twice the density and can last a lot longer than wet poured concrete. So now onto the 10 steps. Um, most likely you won't have this 10 steps unless you've been to our office before, but if you want to be able to keep this as a reference or outline for when you're doing your project, you can get it at our website. Um, also, if you're doing your own project and you have any questions, whether product or installation related, we have a DIY with WI Facebook page um, where you can ask any questions or post pictures of your projects. Um, also, you can find some of the email through our website if you have any other questions as well. Uh, but our website is a very useful tool as well as our brochure that has all of the installation instructions and lots of product info. So 10 steps instructions is what I'm going to be following. I want to start with step one, which is design. A lot of you have probably already made a design. Uh, I always like to draw a design on graph paper. That way I can use each square in the graph paper to represent a square foot. So when I'm ordering my materials like the paving stones and uh, how much gravel and sand I need, uh, that can be a reference for how much material you need, you can use a material calculator and you can pre-order all your materials that way when you do your project and be efficient and fluid and hopefully get it done as fast as possible. Um, so after you've made your design, you can move on to step two, which is layout. So what I like to do is I like to go to where the project is gonna be. And typically you'd be doing this with marking paint and just, you will always wanna make sure you use white marking paint. It turns out that pretty much every color of marking paint is a utility. Um, so before you do your excavation, you want to make sure you get a locate. And in order to avoid any potential errors, uh, always use white marking paint. And that's technically the color of excavation outline. So always use white marking paint. So you're going to go outside. Now I'm just going to use a basic 10 by 20 patio. Really easy math, common size. Just gonna go out there with our marking paint, kind of get a, a rough estimate of how big everything's gonna be. So once you have it marked out, this is the time where you could um, add some curves or make it larger or smaller, it just kind of depends on what you want. You can see how proportional is to your house. Um, but once you've established that that's the size and the shape of the project that you want, you always wanna make sure you go back and you can do this solid or dotted, but you're gonna add six inches around the perimeter, because this outline you made with the marking paint represents where your paving stones are gonna be, but you actually need to excavate six inches past the edge of your paving stones and have gravel base compacted past that. That way, whatever form of edge restraint you use, it sits on that gravel and it lasts a lot longer. Um, so step two is layout, which is where you mark it out with your paint, add curves, make it larger, smaller. Um, just make sure however you big or small you decide to make your project, you go around and you add an extra six inches for excavation and base. All right, now we can go on to step three, just get it square. Uh, so making a square line really helps you the most uh, when you're laying the paving stones, but to avoid any under digging or over digging, it helps a lot to make your square lines first. So what I always do, if you're working off a foundation, um, is to take a couple of stakes, wooden ones or metal ones, and you're gonna put them on each end of your foundation. You wanna put them outside of your foundation. Then you're gonna stretch that line across there. Okay, so 
we're getting it square. So in order to establish square, we first have to make a straight reference. So obviously we want to lay our paving stones straight with our house. So in order to get that as straight as possible, what we're going to do is we're going to get it as close. We're going to go down. We're going to move that string as close as we can to our concrete foundation because no matter what any concrete guy says, there is not a perfectly straight foundation in the world. So we're going to get that string as close as we can to that foundation without touching it. And that will make sure that we're as straight with our house as we can. Okay. And then to make a perpendicular reference line, we're going to go right along the edge where we want our paving stones to be. That way we can use this square line later to lay. Um, and we're going to string it out this way. Same thing, couple of stakes. And then we're going to do what's called the Pythagorean theorem or the three, four, five triangle. Uh, for more info on that, we actually have a video uh, linked on our website or our YouTube um, that shows how to do that. But for the sake of the seminar, I'm just going to kind of write it out. So you measure three feet this way and you make a mark. You measure four feet this way or vice versa, it doesn't matter. Uh, but the point is, is to get five feet across exactly this way. And this will make sure that you have a perfect right angle and that you're perfectly square. And like I said, this is really helps mostly with laying the paving stones because most patterns are straight and long. Uh, but it's also good to do it before you excavate. Uh, that way you have no under digging or over digging. Just a little bit more efficiency there. Um, so we've made a straight line, which is step three, get it square. Then you can move on to step four, which is set the grade. Um, so a common misconception with concrete interlocking paving stones is that you can make them perfectly level and water will drain through them. There is a type of paving stones called permeable paving stones where that is the case. Uh, they're mainly used for commercial applications, uh, but the main type of paving stones installed today are called sand set paving stones. And you actually need to add a little bit of slope so that water can efficiently drain off of them and not uh, wash away any of your bedding sand or the sand in your quarter minus and um, make it settle. Um, so what we're going to do is it's pretty easy. Um, in real life, it's a little bit different. I'll kind of draw it out on the board. Uh, what I always do is I take a stake at the top, top of our house, and put a stake here at the bottom. And the first thing you want to establish is your grade or where you want the top of your paving stones to be. So what you do is if you have an existing concrete landing or step or maybe just the threshold of the bottom of your door, that's where you're going to want your paving stones to be flat with first. So what you do is you stretch a string and you can use your square string, kind of a dual function there. Take my string line. What we're going to do is we're going to wrap it and we're going to, and you already have this line up for your square. Oops, you just fell right out of there. A little bit of gravel. We also have a blog on how to tie a string line around a stake. That just makes it a little bit easier to do. Went too low here. Okay. There we go. It's a little bit easier when you double wrap it, tie it off. Okay. So this is going to be roughly close to where we want the top of our paving stones to be. And then what we do is if we get it close, you know, just by eye level, then you put a string line level on there. Then you want to make it actually level. So I am that much off there. Yeah, that's why. There we go. So just get it kind of close to start and then level it based on that as close as we can. Um, and then, like I said, we're going to have to have some slope or some grade. And we always want to make sure that we slope uh, the water away from any structure, obviously, to avoid deterioration. So if we have a house, we want to slope this way. Sometimes that can be kind of hard, depending on your landscape. You might need to slope it the other way. But for this simple scenario, we're going to slope it away from the house. And so what you do is you have this level line across your foundation. And then you have your perpendicular square line to start from. And if it's touching the line up here, and then you make it level based on that, then you'll know that both those strings are all level with each other. And that's your reference to use. But what you actually have to do is this string, along with as many strings as you need uh, throughout the project, for 20 feet, I would probably do about four string lines. And like I said, each time 
You're going to start this, the string by touching this top line that's already level, then making this string level, then you're going to drop it down here. I'll kind of demonstrate that. So what you do is the rule of thumb is about an eighth of an inch per linear foot. So if we have 10 feet coming away from our house, we're going to slope it about an inch and a quarter. So what we do is we go down here and we measure inch and a quarter from our string line, make a mark on the stake, loosen our stake, and then rewrap it around that mark. This is where it's kind of beneficial to have wooden stakes because you can make nice marks. Now, metal stakes don't work good for that. This is just a quick reference. So now, at least on this first line, we have our slope. And like I said, you're going to repeat that process um, for all the lines, as many as you need away from your house. Like I said, we only have four here. We're going to start level and then drop it on these ends. Um, and it kind of helps too to make another string across the bottom here. Um, then you can make sure that all your strings are consistent with each other by making that one uh, level at the end. Um, so after you've established your grade, you can move on to step five, which is excavate. Uh, like I said before, though, with the marking paint thing, you want to make sure that you get a locate done. They're always free. Um, you just call the number in your area, and they come out and they locate everything. Typically, a lot of times, you don't have a lot of things underneath your backyard, um, but it's always good to double check because if you hit any utility throughout that process that you didn't get located, you will be fined, and it's going to become a costly project at the end of it. So get a locate, then you come in there, and... This is probably gonna be the hardest part of your process. So dirt is the largest volume of material you will move in your project. So dirt, um, there's typically about five yards of dirt uh, per 200 square feet. Um, and it kind of depends on the depth of excavation, but for a patio or a walkway, we always recommend seven inches of excavation. Uh, what that does is it gives you four inches for compact with three quarter minus, uh, one inch of bedding sand, and the most common height of paving stones is 60 millimeter. Uh, but your depth of excavation can differentiate depending on the height of paving stone you use. But like I said, 60 millimeter or two and three eighths uh, is the most common. So two and three eighths plus one inch plus four inches, I know equals seven and three eighths. Uh, but most paving stones you compact at the end of your project and you will lose that three eighths. So that's why we always use seven inches as just a general rule of thumb. Um, so seven inches is how much you will excavate. And like I said, within 200 square feet, will have roughly five yards of dirt. Um, you probably don't have to haul all of that away. If you have anywhere in your backyard, you can hide that dirt. It will save you some money and time. Um, I would keep a half a yard to a yard uh, just back there in case for when we're done, we have something to cover our um, exposed gravel edges from our edge restraint. That way, you know, you can have your grass grow back in there. So you don't necessarily need to move all that dirt, but definitely keep some to cover up your edges, at least the clean stuff. Um, but and, and throughout this process, you will have to rent some equipment. You probably don't always need an excavator or a dump truck or dump trailer. Um, you can haul away dirt in just your, your three-quarter ton pickup if you need to. Um, one thing that you will want to rent throughout this process is probably a plate compactor. It uh, ensures that you get good compaction on your gravel, and it's really beneficial to have it for your paving stones. It could break less than a hand tamper will. Um, but regardless, I know that all these rental fees can seem like they're adding up. Um, and you probably are doing this to save a little bit of money. Uh, but I just want you to know that no matter how much equipment you rent, even if you rent an excavator and a dump truck and a plate compactor and a table saw, uh, there's no way that you could be more expensive to do this project yourself than if you hired somebody, um, at least in this area. Uh, there's just, you can add all those costs together and it's still gonna be probably half as much as it would cost to hire somebody. So you're saving yourself a lot of money uh, by doing the labor yourself, which is the most expensive part of the project, not the equipment rental. So, we're going to excavate. Uh, if you don't know how to run an excavator or a skid steer, uh, a pickaxe will be your best friend throughout this process. I typically have to pickaxe to get seven inches, probably two times. Three and a half inches each time is pretty general. Clean it up really good. Um, and you're going to be using these string lines as a reference. You're going to be measuring with your tape measure underneath these string lines like this. You go, okay, am I at seven inches yet? No, I'm not. So you have to keep digging underneath that and just make it as continuous as you can. I know that there's gonna be some weird spots in between these string lines. If you need to set up more string lines throughout the process, to double, double check that and feel good about it, then you can do that. But whatever you need to do to achieve seven inches below all these string lines, um, the better. So that's excavation. Once it's nice and clean, it's nice, good practice to make good straight up and down sidewalls. It just helps with compaction of gravel and stuff later. 
Uh, but once it's all out of there, you can move on to step six, which is set the baits. Uh, so first, we always recommend, at least in Oregon, a three quarter minus crushed gravel. You can find it anywhere and it has the proper compaction specifications uh, for concrete interlock and paving stones. Um, if you don't have that, if you're in Washington, five eighths minus is suffice. Uh, if you don't know about, if you have three quarter or five eighths, if you look at your DOT, your state's D Department of Transportation recommendation for road base, that will be suffice for paver base. Um, but typically it's three quarter minus or five eighths. Um, so before you bring your base in, I wanna talk a little bit about geotextile. So geotextile around here, we always reference it as a cheap insurance policy. So what this is, is a high strength polymer woven fabric. See, I can't tear it. It's very, very, very heavy duty. And this thing does, this does two things. One thing it does, which is the most important thing, is it separates dirt from wanting to migrate up into your gravel. And when that happens, it can promote settling. So the more time you take into doing preventative measures, uh, the less settling you have and less repairs you do. So the, the better you do this the first time, basically is what I'm saying, uh, the more long it will last and the better it will look over time. So if you put that geo down there, dirt won't be able to come up into your gravel and will promote settling through freeze-thaw cycles. Um, but basically what you do is you lay it down and it's always good practice to kind of wrap it up the sidewalls. It just gives it a little bit of extra tensile strength. Um, and like I said, it prevents the dirt from coming up into your gravel. And also another function is if you have any minor settling in some spots, it can kind of bridge that uh, from happening or settling as fast because of its high tensile strength. So I always recommend geotextile. It's cheap insurance policy. Um, it doesn't, it can't ever hurt a situation. It's always good to have that just in case. Um, but you lay your geo down and then you bring in your gravel because this is three quarter minus. And through this process, again, you use these string lines to excavate. It's always easy also to use these uh, as you bring in your base. So you want to get four inches after compaction. So what you do, um, and it kind of depends on your size of compactor, but the typical plate compactor weighs about 150 pounds that you'll rent. Uh, it's actually only rated for two inch lift. So what I always do if I only have that size of plate compactor um, is I bring the gravel up to about five inches below the string line. So when you excavate it, you brought in seven, and you make sure it was dug down seven inches, but when you bring in your gravel, if you only want two inches, you bring it up to five, you're doing a lift. Uh, so get it close and as flat as possible. Then you run your plate compactor over it. I just do it once each direction. Um, if it's been a while since you had your gravel delivered and it's dried out a little bit, you can hit it with a garden hose, just kind of mist it. That will help with the compaction. Definitely don't flood it, uh, but get it moist and kind of dark. Um, after you bring in that two inches and you compact, then you can bring in an additional two inches and you will get closer. You'll bring it up to uh, three inches below your string line, um, compact it again, and then you'll probably have to add a little bit more gravel. And then by that, that third compaction, you'll be very, very, very close, okay? And the more time you spend uh, making sure everything is flat and consistent and continuous, uh, the more flat and consistent and continuous your paving stones will be. Obviously, over decades of time, the paving stones will eventually settle, but the more time and preventative measures you do and the time you spend in making your base flat, uh, the less dramatic that settling will be. Um, so check your string lines periodically, set up more if you need to closer together. Uh, but basically, like I said, by that third compact, you'll be very, very close. And what I always do is I do that third compact and I'll leave these two first string lines I set up because I'm gonna use this for square when I lay later, uh, but I'll take away these other string lines because I know I'm very close, like probably within a quarter of an inch. So I take those away and then what I do is I, put, I take a two by four, like a six foot, eight foot, two by four, uh, as flat as you can see. And I'll just go and I'll kind of fluff everything up, just kind of rake it. And what that does is it bridges any imperfections in between your string lines if they're kind of far apart. And so it just makes everything as flat as possible. And then I'll compact it one last time. And then by there, it'll be ready. Okay, so we've brought in our gravel, we've compacted it. Make sure you want to compact your gravel in lifts if you have that smaller plate compactor. Um, once everything looks nice and flat, we're going to move on to step seven, which is screed the sand bed. Um, so the type of sand you would want to use is concrete sand, washed concrete sand. And um, if you have this delivered before you do your project, especially in the summertime, it most likely has dried out. Uh, this stuff works best if it's moist. So if you're bringing in dry, make sure you wet it down just kind of like what you, what you did with the gravel. If your gravel is dry, to make it nice and moist. Um, and the easiest way to do this and the fastest is to use some sort of a uniform rail, like a, these are called screed rails. You just want to make sure that one 
they're one inch in outside diameter and two, they're nice and heavy. Cause if you try and use like PVC, uh, you just can't efficiently pull sand away from that because if you do, the PVC rails will move. Um, and also you just wanna make sure that when you're screeding, you, can o you only wanna screed what you can lay in a day. Uh, if it's the sun's out and you have an open area of screeded sand, the sun will bake it dry and will lose its uh, structure. Or if it's raining outside and you leave it out in the rain, it'll be oversaturated with water. So it's optimal to have it moist and cover it up if you can't finish laying the stones in that day to keep it moist and covered and then screed the next section and finish laying it the next day or whenever you have time again. So I've got my rails down. This is a good time to double check for level and flat. Um, you can use a screed board similar to the one that you use to drag your gravel across. Just a nice flat board. Eight or 10 feet is a little bit easier because you're screeding less. Um, so plop it across there and you can check level side to side. Uh, it's easiest to typically screed away and down away from the house just with your slope. Naturally, it's the easiest. Um, so you're gonna screed a section at a time. So check level crossways and you can also double check your rails. Make sure they have a uniform slope on the bubble uh, throughout the process. So. You set your rails nice and smooth this is also a good indication that your gravel base is nice and flat. There's not a lot of um, voids or anything underneath our rails. Um, so then you bring in your sand. Typically it's easiest to just dump this in with a wheelbarrow, but we're working off of pallets here. Um, so we're just gonna shovel it. And we have a pretty small area, so it's not super important that you get a lot of it. You can see my sand is a nice dark color. It's a good indicator that it's nice and moist. If it's a light gray, it means it's probably pretty dry. Like I said, you just want it moist. You don't want it wet to where you see water pumping out of it. You want it just moist. And that just makes it nice and dense when you screed it. It's nice and thick for when you lay your pavers on it. My board here. Get my shovels. Okay, we're gonna start with that, see how close we get. And now typically you'd be pulling the board towards you, but for the sake of that you guys are watching me, I'm just gonna push it away from me, that way you can kind of see how it works. And you'll, kind of, you'll be able to tell why it's sort of important that um, it's nice and wet, moist. <clears throat> Swing to the edge. And it's also good practice to screed past the edge of where your paving stones are gonna be. Uh, that way, if you can avoid some cuts by laying an extra couple inches, um, you can do that. And also, you're going to pull the sand away later. just makes it a little bit easier to have it past your edge, not, not right at the very edge, because then if you lay to it, you're not right there. You don't have to mess with it. So, screed a section and longer rails is easiest, so you don't have to move and adjust as much. So these little short rails, I just got to pull them down a little bit. Continue to push and you can see because it's moist it's getting this good flat continuous structure here need to add just a little bit more finish us off Gather it around here, spread it out. And then for the sake of the video, we're just gonna pull it right off of our edge here. Okay. So we pulled our sand away. No longer need our nice flat two by four. And we can pull up our rails, and obviously you're gonna need to fill these voids with some more sand. You can do that a couple different ways. The easiest for me is just do it with a trowel, and I'll show you that. Uh, but if you have a nice flat broom, you'll notice I talk about nice flat things like two by fours and brooms like they just magically appear, but sometimes you can find them. You just toss a little bit of excess sand in your voids here. Grab a trowel, the bigger the better. And you just sort of fill them in. Fill them in, make it as flat as you can as you can do. 
consistency is key in a paving stone system. Oh, it's nice and bad. I have just a little more to finish off this side. And that's good. All right. So when starting to lay, if you've taken down your square reference line at some point, that's fine. I'm going to put it up again, probably before you screed. That way you don't mess up your sand when you're trying to do your square line. Either way, get a good square line down. For the sake of time in my small area, I'm going to use speed square. If I were doing this at my house, I would want to make sure I had a nice, long, continuous line set up. Uh, that way, I made sure I was consistent with the project. So, like I said, you want six inches past your paving stone. So, I'm going to hold this in about six inches. I'm going to start my pattern here. So, our brochure is a very cool, useful tool. Um, it has lots of information on how to install paving stones. It has patterns, colors, blends, obviously, for our specific stones. But... In terms of starting a pattern that can be kind of challenging, especially if it's a multi-size pattern, but our brochure has some cool examples of how to start a pattern. Uh, we also have a video on patterns. Uh, there's more to patterns than just how they look. There's also some structure involved. So for vehicular situations, you might want a specific pattern. Um, but the type of stone I'm gonna lay today is called Holland Stone. We're doing it in our uh, newly ran run called Cambridge Blend. Um, we didn't offer any Cambridge before, now we do. Uh, regardless, this is step eight which is lay the stones. So, just gonna start my pattern here. Depending on the type of stone, your pattern can start at different. Uh, because we offer Holland stone in the four by eight and the four by four, you can start this pattern. And if you're nice and square and you have a straight big area, you can actually lay this with very minimal cutting. And that's sort of key to making a fast, quick project make it easier on yourself is to do square lines. But I know that's not for everybody. Everybody likes, some people like curves and stuff. So obviously there's no way around curves without cutting. There's just no way. And you don't need to be scared of cutting. Cutting can be pretty easy. Uh, but it's just the idea of renting a saw. And you want to cut wet. Either way, start laying your pattern. Like I said, I'm, I'm kind of withholding six inches away from the edge here. So I'm gonna end it about right there. That looks like about six inches. And you would do the same thing if you're laying your pattern across a big continuous area. You'd wanna stop the pattern whenever you're very close to six inches. And if it helps without any cuts, that's ideal. So I've got these half hollands, these four by fours. I'm kinda of just plopping in here, just kinda of show you how that's done. You also wanna make sure that when you're laying, it's good practice to do what's called the click and drop method. Basically what you do is you butt them into the corner and then slide them down. You don't want to set them in the sand and pull them because you'll sweep your bling, you'll bring sand into your paver joint. It'll make for ununiform lines. Once you get the hang of a pattern, typically lay just about anything pretty quick. The smaller the stone, the longer it takes to lay. I'm not trying to scare you away from smaller stones. Uh, smaller stones have more structure. Uh, this pattern, the herringbone pattern, is actually the strongest pattern you can use in the paver world. This is very common for vehicular traffic because of its strength. And this stone specifically, the Holland stone, very common stone. Um, it's the strongest stone with that pattern. You can do the herringbone pattern with any rectangle, uh, but it's the stronger with the Holland stone because of its one half ratio. Like I said, you're using the click and drop method. You just button it up together and slide, slide. And we're gonna use some half Hollands plug in our areas here. And as soon as your area is big enough to stand on, you can lay off that area. Obviously, this is a very small area. If you had a 10 by 20, like my example, uh, you want to get on there as soon as possible. Kind of helps. Um, you know, you have these first two square lines for reference, but also maybe halfway through your project, it'd be good to do another one. Because if you start out square, it's pretty good. But to maintain square throughout the project, it's good practice just to set one up in the middle. Then what you'll do is you'll measure from each side of the line. And, and as long as the measurement is the same from here to here to this from here to here, that means that this line is also square. You don't have to do the three, four, five again. Um, I would do it halfway through, then I would do it at the end. And that way I just make sure everything's nice and square and perfect. So, like I said, I've got a few more of these half hollands to plug in. 
This is nice and square, so no cuts for me. Um, if you do have any cuts, like I said, you can rent a table saw or a demo saw. Um, it's easiest to mark them with like a, a piece of flexible pipe like PVC. You can just lay it on there, make sure you have it consistent with each corner, if you have two corners, uh, mark it and cut it. Uh, whatever you need to do there, as far as renting a saw, you can use a splitter. If you just have a couple cuts, like if you don't have half hollands, you need a couple halves, you can split them with a chisel. It's not necessarily the nicest looking cut you can do, but if you're in a pinch, it will get it done. So you've laid your area. Now you can move on to restraint. Another thing too is when you're pulling your sandway for this restraint, uh, which is step nine, uh, you, you want it to be moist still. So if you lay your patio on Saturday, uh, you take the night off because you worked really hard that day, obviously laying your stones. You wake up Sunday, it's been sunny. Uh, your sand is dry. So you want to go around with the garden hose, mist it all off, get it nice and wet. That way when you pull it away like I'm about to show you, it uh, pulls away nice and clean. I'll get a good shot of that here with this camera as I approach the front. So the objective is, is to scrape this sand away down to the gravel and then whatever kind of restraint we use, whether it's concrete or snap edge, it's going to sit right on top of the gravel, nice and firm. So straight down. You can use a shovel to do this too if you want to. Straight down and pull away. And the more straight and uniform you make this, this edge here, the easier and better looking your restraint will be. Pulling down to the gravel here. This edge. Just pulling it away lightly here. Like I said, you don't want the sand, you want the gravel. I'm making a mess, but it's okay. All right. So the easiest form of restraint for anybody is probably snap edge. So snap edge is cool because it's 100% recycled plastic, which is a plus. Uh, but you don't have to be worried about it. It comes in straight lines, but it can also do curves. So you got outside curves, you just snip all these little ribs. You can also do inside curves and just fold those ribs over or cut them shorter. Either way, there's no limitations to that. So I have a couple of pieces here, pre-cut, maybe you have to recut. Make them fit. Oh boy. Oh man. Beautiful. Perfect. Okay, so what you do is you come in and you set your snap edge. And um, you'll notice earlier when I was using my string line, I was just using some of these nails, but you want to use 10 inch regular seal spikes. Uh, you actually want these to rust over time because one, they will adhere with the snap edge and make it a little bit stronger. And also the rust will make this spike underground in your gravel multiply in size and become stronger. So for the sake of the fact that I'm laying these stones on a gravel frame with limited depth, I have some pre-cut little four inch spikes. You wouldn't want to do this on your project. You definitely want to have the 10 inch spikes, but because of my situation, um, just to demonstrate, um, these four inch spikes are going to work. So you take a, pop your spikes in. So the rule of thumb for pedestrian traffic, uh, for how many spikes you do in this snappage, because there's multiple holes, um, is every one foot, uh, if you're doing a, a driveway or a vehicular traffic area, you want to do it every other hole, which equals out to put every eight inches, just a little bit stronger. Uh, me personally, I like to do it every other hole, uh, just extra strength, it doesn't hurt. It's a little bit more costly. The spikes can be expensive, um, but in terms of longevity, you want as much strength as possible. So I'll wrap around to the front here. It's a little bit easier to see what I'm doing. Uh, one advantage, advantage also of snap edge over concrete is that its ability for grass to be able to grow through it. It's the easiest for snap edge. It's got all these wide open spaces, lots of dirt. Um, easiest to grow grass back, snap edge. Easiest to hide too. The concrete will typically come up to the same height, but will come out farther. And, a little bit harder to do if you're a novice or you don't, you've never done that before. But this is really easy. Everybody owns a hammer, or they should. That's pretty much all you need to install it. Shovel and a hammer. So we've installed our snap edge. Uh, if you are laying off the foundation, you notice I didn't put snap edge on this side. That's because our foundation is going to act as our restraint. Um, so if you have any voids in there, because when you put your string line on there, you're 
foundation is a little wiggly, you just fill those joints with sand, that's fine. Um, so after you put your snap edge in, you can compact. Uh, if you're using our product, you can reference our brochure if you can compact those, those, those stones. Uh, there is a few stones like slabs or our Lalastra line or Pietro Quattro that you're not supposed to compact. They're too big, they will break. Um, so you don't need to worry about compacting those, but anything smaller like these Holland stone, uh, we do recommend compaction. It's pretty uh, important for the first phase of interlock. Um, so you take that same plate compactor you use for the gravel most likely. If it's a small 150 pound one, that will be perfect. Uh, I always compact it once each way, once each direction. And then you bring in some sweeping sand, sweep in your joints. Uh, this is, it's pretty good practice to kind of overfill them. And then when you compact that second and last time, uh, all that excess sand that was up high, it will help work it into those joints. It's kind of frustrating to sweep in joint sand. Those voids can be hard to fill. Uh, so compacting them will actually help those voids fill up easier. So it's easier to use a plate compactor when sweeping in because it will work the sand in the joints a lot, lot faster uh, than you can with a broom. Um, so you sweep it that or compact it that second time, and you can sweep off your excess sand and make sure all your joints are uniformly filled. A good rule of thumb is to make it to where basically the sand is at the bottom of this of this stone as low as you can, especially for a vehicular application. If you overfill your sand joints, which is common, uh, you'll be kicking sand at your driveway for a long time. So the the minimal amount of sand to where you can barely see it, uh, the better. It doesn't need it all the way to the very top of the stone itself. Uh, we say one inch below the top, one eighth of an inch below the top of the stone is pretty um, standard. So compact it, sweep it in, it's swept, cover your edge your edge restraint with some dirt, some dirt. Like I said earlier in the, in the excavation phase, it's always good to keep a little bit of dirt to cover it up with. Or if you wanna do something fancy like some round rock, uh, you could do that too. Um, but basically after it's swept in, it's pretty much done. Um, uh, in the Pacific Northwest specifically, it's pretty common to have moss and weeds in your paving stones. Uh, everybody knows that moss and weeds will grow on rocks, so it's very uh, possible that they can blow in the, or grow in the joint sand. Um, so there's a couple things you can do pre to prevent that. Uh, one thing you can do is use what's called polymeric sand. There's a variety of different brands. Uh, basically, the, the instructions are all pretty similar. You sweep in the sand dry, just like you do with regular dry sand, um, and then you blow off the excess and you activate it with water and that joint sand will harden and that will prohibit uh, and lower your moss and weeds. Um, another thing you can do, which is kind of more optimal and arguably is cost effective typically, is use a sealer on your stones that has a joint stabilization uh, antifungal chemical in it. Uh, so what you would do is you sweep in regular sweeping sand. There's no point in buying the expensive sand to put sealer on. Um, and then you spray or roll this sealer on and it will put a protective layer over the top of your stones and it will harden the sand in your joints uh, to prevent moss and weeds. Uh, whichever route you choose, you have a perfectly functional um, system that is optimal, especially for vehicular traffic. Um, it's probably the most cost-effective uh, pavement system on the market. I hope you enjoy. So we're back here for our second seminar of the day. Uh, we're gonna do a basic planter bed. Um, I'm gonna show you some basic instructions on the board of what your excavation and base would look like. And then we'll come down to the floor and I'll show you our outline and just kind of roughly what it would look like to set block. Uh, so starting out, um, there's a variety of different products that we sell that you can make a planter bed with. The easiest product probably is Chateau Wall. It comes in five different sizes. It comes in a four by eight, uh, 8x8, 8x12, and 8x16. And they're all four inches thick. And it also comes in a chateau bevel, so if you have any curves anywhere, you can integrate those and avoid some cutting. Um, but also it makes it incredibly easy uh, to make a variety of sizes of planters without cuts because you have so many sizes to choose from, you can make a module um, and avoid cutting. So basically the first step to this uh, is kind of mark out your area just like you would with paving stones. You probably won't need a locate for this. It's always good just to double check if you're doing a large planter. Uh, get a locate, make sure there's nothing underneath, water lines, gas lines. Um, and basically mark out your area. If I go to my backyard and I want this rectangle all to be a planter. Now keep in mind your block is really gonna be like this. So you don't necessarily need to dig out everything in here. Really, you just need to focus on your trench virtually uh, 
for your wall. And if we're using an eight inch wide block, I'd make this trench about 12 inches, maybe 16, just to have a little bit of base past the edge of your block. Um, so there's our outline. And just to kind of show you for excavation, some grass above here. We're gonna dig down uh, roughly for a planter bed, it kind of depends on the height, but I would typically want to bury a block and do four inches of gravel for a planter bed. If I was doing a retaining wall, I'd do six inches of gravel. So about eight inches of excavation. It's gonna give you four inches of gravel. And then you have your four inch block. And it's always good to have retention, even in a small planter, um, retention can keep things from wanting to kind of move away from each other. Um, but four inches of gravel for a planter, I'd say I'd, I'd do that up to two feet. If you're doing over a two foot planter, I would do six inches of gravel. Um, put that gravel in there, hand tamp it, and then you start bringing in your block. I'm gonna move to the floor now. So I'm using some Chateau, these are called 400s. They're 16 by eights. Uh, I like to use, for me personally, the biggest, longest blocks uh, when doing a wall or a planter, uh, that way you set less blocks. So for example, if you're doing a planter and you're integrating multiple sizes of Chateau, it'd be faster, especially since it's most likely gonna be buried, to do your base course with the larger blocks. That way you're setting less and it's a little bit faster. And then the layers of court and courses you actually see when you're building your planter that will be exposed, uh, you can integrate your multi-sizes and you get kind of a win-win situation out of that. You get a little bit more structure because they're heavier at the bottom and it's faster because there's less blocks you have to set. So that's the cool thing. What I would do is I get my gravel hand tamped nice and flat. And then I would, I would set my entire outline up first. I wouldn't just start setting blocks level because in order to make it as square and straight as possible, let's get this outline going. So our plant that we're building, um, it's roughly 40 inches by 55. And I can tell you the inside diameter in a minute. It's around 24 by 40, I believe. Just a small one, for example, you can build these as big as you want. If you have a garden in here or even just flowers and you want to minimize your work of uh, watering, you can integrate some sort of irrigation or drip lines. You want to do that before you set your block. Uh, after you set your block, it'd be a little challenging um, to try and do that later or it'd be visible. So if you want it to be invisible, integrate it before you start setting block. Okay, let's check my deal here. One more block. Turn the other way. Like I said, we're just laying this on top of our gravel loose just to kind of get a reference where everything's gonna be. We can double check if we're straight, straight and square. So this planter is only gonna have 400s. Because of the way I mapped it out, uh, you'll just use 400s every course and you'll still be intersecting lines. If you have any issues where you're not intersecting lines, you don't wanna have your lines, your wall or planter built straight up and needs a little bit of interlock and strength from offset lines. It's easiest to achieve with a block like this because it's just halfway, you have a good offset. So lay it on your gravel. Try and just get it square. You can use a level if you want or a speed square. Start from. And once these are all laid on the ground, and this is the fun part, and you get better at this with practice. So you have multiple planters or big one, uh, you'll get better throughout the process. But basically the process is the same for planters or for retaining walls or seating walls set on gravel. They're all the same. If it's on top of gravel and you want it to be level, which is the most structural thing you can do, it takes a little bit of time, but take a level. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna take a hammer, a dead blow hammer or a hard mallet works best. You don't wanna reuse the rubber side, it'll just bounce. And you don't wanna use a metal hammer because you'll most likely break the block. Um, so what you do is you check it level you just pound it on that gravel. This also gives the gravel a little bit more compaction, which is good. Uh, but the main objective is to make it level both ways. Once you've achieved that on one block, you go on to the next. 
and then to the next. And when you have long sections of block like this, you want to use a long level. That way they're all level with each other. It's very easy to become a sixteenth of an inch off uh, between two blocks and then lose and start to raise up your grade. So you want to use a big, long level. And the more time you spend making, every sh making sure everything is level and flat, the easier these next rows will stack. Um, but once you've set your base course, everything's nice and level and flat, then you can talk about gluing uh, your second course. So what you would do, there's a variety of different glues you can use. I always recommend Sherbon 20. Uh, it's very strong and it's flexible. Um, there's some other glues that Sherbon sells that are also very good, but this to me is the most cost effective and gives me a lot of insurance because of it. So um, it's easiest for me to do uh, dots in the corners of these blocks. Since they're a planter, you don't really need a lot of um, a lot of glue. Like on a retaining wall with this type of block, I would do um, continuous stripes. Uh, you don't want to do them like intersecting each other because the water won't be able to weep out of that wall or planter, but stripes uh, perpendicular with it are the most structural and water can weep out of it. But for a planter where it's really not supporting a whole lot except for the dirt you put inside of it, it's easiest for me just to do it. I'm only gonna do these on a couple block just for the sake of the video. And then after that, we'll just put everything on dry. You wanna hold these about an inch away from each corner. See? And that's all you would really need. <clears throat> it's good for drainage. Make sure you don't have any water uh, not being able to drain out of there because if it just sits there on the glue, it will deteriorate the glue faster. So put some glue on there. And then just start setting your next course. Check squares go. Like I said, there's no cuts. I have used any other size of block on this planter. I mapped it out to where I only have to use one size, my favorite size, just the 16 inch. Probably just do two rows for the video. Obviously you can make this as high as you want for your sake. Kind of depends on what you got going on. But the process is all the same. Glue and stack and glue and stack. Um, and once you're pretty much satisfied with it, I always like to line my planter beds with some filter fabric. That way, whatever moisture does weep out of there, um, it's at least clean. That way, dirt isn't constantly uh, washing out onto the faces of my block and making my block dirty. So, Get close here. So make sure when you're gluing too, it's also good to make sure that uh, your blocks are nice and dry. These glues do work wet, but they work better and faster if they're dry and um, dust free. So just kind of brush them off, blow them off, make them as clean as possible. So we've got two rows here, which gives me about eight inches of height. Obviously, if you have a coarse berry, it'll only be about four, but you can go as high as you want. Um, keep gluing and stacking. Like I said, when you get to a point where you think you're finished, you can add a cap if you want. There's a variety of different caps that we sell. Um, you may have to do some cutting on the caps, it kind of just depends. Uh, but if once you put the dirt in, make sure you line it with some sort of filter fabric, not geotextile, but filter fabric. Uh, that way, whatever water comes out doesn't have dirt in it and make everything dirty. And put whatever kind of plants you want in there. Drip line is nice if you don't want to have to water everything. And that's pretty much a planter.